Welcome to Spring Creek Church. We are so excited that you are with us today. If you're new and you'd like to find out more information about our church, all you have to do is text NEW to 96995. Also, if you'd like to find out all the things that are happening at our Garland campus and the things that are happening online, all you have to do is visit us on our website, springcreekchurch.org slash events for all the things that are happening here. Guys, I hope that you enjoy the service. Well, today's a very special day here at Spring Creek because I'm going to take you through a communion service. I want to explain to you about the origins of communion, what's it all about, why we do it the way we do, and then at the end, we're going to have an opportunity to partake together. This would be a really good time since you're watching at home. If you want to participate with me at the end of this video to go to your cabinet, to your cupboard, cupboards and, and get crackers or a piece of bread or a piece of tortilla or pita, something like that. And the fruit of the vine, it can be grape juice, it could be any kind of juice that you might have. And join me at the end in this time of communion together. As we get started though, I'd like you to pray with me. Father, we are thankful that we have this time to be in your word and to gather in your presence. And I'm so grateful that we have this point of connection with our online community. People who come across our website from time to time will go and check out Spring Creek Church. And this is just a really good day to zero down in on some of the values that really make us distinctive as Christians. So I pray, Lord, that today, not only will we learn a lot, but that we will meet with you in the midst of this very special commemorative meal. In Jesus' name, amen. Apollo 11 was the spacecraft that landed the first two people on the moon. When the lunar module touched down on July 20th, 1969, the very first thing the astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had to do was wait. You see, NASA wanted to give them some downtime after their long flight so they would be well rested before taking the first ever moonwalk and other activities that they had planned for them. So as the men rested and mentally prepared for the next stage of their mission, Aldred got on the comm system and spoke to the ground crew back on Earth. To the public, this is what he said. I'd like to take this opportunity to ask every person listening in, whoever and wherever they may be, to pause for a moment and contemplate the events of the past few hours and to give thanks in his or her own way. But when the radio transmission had ended, Aldrin read a verse from the Gospel of John and took communion. On the screen are the actual notes that Aldrin carried with him into space for his private communion service. Listen to him describe it. In the radio blackout, I opened the little plastic packages which contained the bread and the wine. I poured the wine into the chalice our church had given me. In the one-sixth gravity of the moon, the wine slowly curled up gracefully and came up the other side of the cup. Then I read the scripture, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me will bring forth much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now think about how significant this actually was. The very first liquid and the very first food ever consumed on the surface of the moon in the lunar lander were the elements of communion. That's the actual bag that uh, carried Aldrin's chalice into space for this historic communion service. Now, originally, Aldrin had wanted to broadcast the service to the entire world, but the atheist activist Madeleine Murray O'Hare, who had once been dubbed the most hated woman in America, just a few months prior had sued NASA over Apollo 8 astronauts because they read from the book of Genesis during their broadcast made on Christmas Day, 1968, when they became the first humans to orbit the moon. Though her lawsuit was ultimately dismissed, NASA was a little worried that any overtly religious display might open the agency to another lawsuit. So when Aldrin told the flight crew, an operations manager, about his plans to broadcast his communion service, the manager told him, go ahead and have communion, but keep your comments more general. So Aldrin kept the ceremony low key. This is why for a number of you listening to me right now, this is the first time you've ever heard anything about it. So where I'd like to begin today is with where it all got started. Let's talk about the origin of communion. I'd like to begin with the institution of Passover. To really understand communion, 
you have to first understand Passover. The Passover was instituted by God on the evening of the day that the Israelites were to be delivered out of 400 years of Egyptian bondage. In the middle of the 10th and worst of all the plagues that fell on Egypt, God established a special commemorative meal. But first, he tells his people an unblemished unblemished lamb was to be taken from the flock and brought into the house for four days prior to Passover. During this four-day period, the family would naturally grow very attached to the lamb. But then on the fourth day, the father was to slaughter the lamb, then spread its blood on the two doorposts and over the entryway of the house. This blood was to serve as a sign that this home was protected and exempted from the judgment. The death angel would pass over that home and not visit it. The truth is, no matter how you slice it, it's a very disturbing story. It's the kind of story we want to clean up a bit. We want to sanitize it, minimize it, even change it. In fact, you might feel somewhat uncomfortable even now as you think about the circumstances surrounding the slaughter of that lamb. But this Passover experience is pointing to something even more disturbing. It's pointing to a time when Jesus, the Lamb of God, would offer himself as a sacrifice for humankind. When his blood would be applied to a large piece of wood, similar to the wood of the doorframe, so that we all could be spared the judgment. There's simply no escaping the fact that Jesus' story is even more bloody, horrific, and gruesome. What I'm saying is simply this. If you try to sanitize the Passover story, you lose the meaning of the cross. It was the same way with the very first sin. To provide a covering for Adam and Eve, to clothe them, God had to make them clothing from the skin of an animal, which meant the animal had to be sacrificed. For us to receive salvation, we needed the same covering. Blood must be shed. This is why the Bible says in both Old and New Testaments, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or cleansing of sins. That's Leviticus 17 and Hebrews 9. Now, you can try to soften it, water it down, even dilute its strength. It seems barbaric and pre-civilized, but you're mistaken if you think this teaching was any less repulsive or difficult in Bible days. The killing of the family lamb and the blood spread all around the front door was no more palatable palatable to them then than it is right now. In fact, I think God intentionally chose an act that was repulsive and caused great feelings of loss because this is a foreshadowing of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So let's look more closely at how the Passover reveals Christ, beginning with the Lamb of God. One of the curious things about Passover is the fact that the lamb had to be taken in and lived with in the family until it was killed. God wanted them to get to know the lamb and to bond with it. When it was no longer just a lamb, but their lamb, then it was to be sacrificed. Now, here's the deal. Much of the symbolism of Jesus last week is lost to us because we don't understand these Jewish customs. For example, Jesus came to the city of Jerusalem five days before the lamb was to be killed as a part of Passover. But we also know from history that five days before the lamb was to be sacrificed, it was chosen. So Jesus literally enters Jerusalem on lamb selection day. When Jesus enters the city, he enters the heart of the people as their Passover lamb. He's welcomed. He lives among them. He connects to them. He cares for them. And then they reject him. And then he was slaughtered. If you go back to the institution of Passover, you discover that the lamb was to be slaughtered at a very specific time. The Hebrew literally says between the two evenings. And that's because the Jewish people had an early evening around three o'clock and a late evening around five. The lamb had to be killed between 3 and 5 in the afternoon. Do you remember what the Bible says in Matthew 27, 46? About 3 in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When did Jesus die? He died shortly after 3 o'clock on Friday. At the very moment when the cries of the lamb could be heard coming from the temple, Jesus was the Passover lamb. And just in case that isn't clear enough, Paul wrote this, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Peter added this comment. He said, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. 
He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Now think about this. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God killed an animal in order to clothe their nakedness and cover their guilt. There was a one-to-one relationship between grace and sin, one animal for one person. On the night of the first Passover, one lamb was killed for each family gathering, so it was one lamb for an entire family. Later at Mount Sinai, God taught them on the Day of Atonement, all the sin of Israel would be covered for one year through one lamb. That was one lamb for an entire nation. But when Jesus dies on the cross, it's one lamb for the entire world. That's what God had been building toward and pointing to since the beginning of human history. Next, we see the bread of life. So as a part of Passover, the Jews were to eat unleavened bread or bread that lacked yeast. You see, in order to make bread rise, you have to take something from a past loaf that is fermented and you put that into the new loaf so that the dough will rise. But on the occasion of Passover, as they're leaving Egypt, God wants nothing from the past to be brought into their present life. He wants them to leave Egypt behind once and for all. So leaven or yeast became symbolic of sin or the past that clings to us. Unleavened bread means you're moving out of Egypt and you want no more of its corrupting influence to carry with you into the future. Now it's interesting, immediately after Passover ends, begins another Jewish festival called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It begins Friday evening at sunset, so right after Passover. No sooner is the Lamb of God slaughtered than the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. Now, here's what would happen. The Jews would take some of their grain, the first fruits of their harvest, to the temple as a sacrifice. On Friday evening, Jesus was made an offering, a sacrifice to God. He's the seed of God, the seed that's offered as sacrifice. And when he died, like a seed, he's planted in the ground. Then he arose and became the first fruits of the resurrected from the dead. You see, it's not just Passover that teaches us about Christ. Jesus is also represented in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In fact, in the upper room on the night that Jesus is betrayed, he seems to be alluding to this very principle with his own disciples. He's, the Bible says, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Or how about this that Paul wrote? But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So Jesus was buried. He's planted in the ground. He becomes the first fruits of the dead. In other words, if Jesus is the first fruit, that means there's more to come. Because he resurrected, we will too. One day we'll all be resurrected. That's what first fruits are all about. It's about the first, but with a promise that there's more to come. So Jesus takes the bread from Passover and says, No longer is this the bread to remind you of Egypt. It's now to remind you of my body, my body, which is given for you. This is what he says in Luke 22, 19. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Jesus is redefining Passover. The old covenant is over. The new covenant has begun. We're no longer looking to a lamb in Egypt, but the lamb of God on a hill called Calvary. Then there's the cup of salvation. So during Passover, there were actually four cups of wine that were consumed over the course of the meal, which were centered on the four I wills of God. This is found in Exodus 6, verses 6 through 7. He says, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Then he says, I will free you from being slaves to them, The third I will is I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And then the final, I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. So the Jewish people used the four cups of Passover to correspond with those four statements that God had made. The first cup they called the cup of sanctification. This is that they were set apart by God. Second cup, the cup of the plagues, which is to remind them of the judgment that set them free from slavery. The third cup is called the cup of redemption, and the fourth cup, the cup of ingathering. So think about these as they apply to Jesus. What Jesus was doing was fulfilling each cup. 
The cup of sanctification represents God gathering his followers together. So Jesus is gathered with the 12. The cup of plagues we see clearly in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember how Jesus cried out in anguish, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. What's he talking about? He's talking about drinking the cup of judgment, your judgment and my judgment. The third cup is called the cup of redemption. So this is what Jesus accomplished on the cross when he paid the price for our sins. It was during the meal that Jesus lifted up the third cup, the cup of redemption, and said to his disciples, this cup is the New Testament or the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you do it in remembrance of Egypt? No. What are we to remember now? Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He then said, drink from it, all of you, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I would add the drinking of the fourth cup, which is the cup of ingathering, that's still happening. We're living in the time of ingathering as God is calling all people to himself. So in every aspect, the institution or the origin of communion has its roots in the ancient observance of Passover. Jesus is the fulfillment of Passover. But I also want to remind you culturally about the significance of this meal. And I call this next point the simplicity of a meal. So get this. In the Middle East, there's three ways to repair a ruptured relationship. One is called the salt covenant. So salt was a very precious commodity. Without modern day refrigeration, salt is one of the only natural preservatives there are. It was valuable. In fact, our word salary comes from the word salt. Did you know that? It's also when we talk about somebody being worth their salt, that's what we mean, they have real value. A second way you repair a ruptured relationship is through the threshold covenant. Now this might remind you of your wedding day when, when two neighbors were at odds and wanted to resolve their differences, they might publicly celebrate their reconciliation by carrying one another over each other's thresholds. That's the threshold covenant. But the most common way of repairing a ruptured relationship is called the meal covenant. This is the common way of doing it. You, you, you look at uh, like this parable of the prodigal son. When he returns home, one of the first things the father did was prepare a meal to celebrate the fact that this relationship, which was once ruptured, is now restored. And you probably remember in the story how the older brother wouldn't eat with his younger sibling because he hadn't forgiven him and eating with him would be like saying the relationship was all right. When Peter fouled up and denied Christ, quit when the going got tough, stood back when he should have stood up. When Jesus sees him again for the first time after his denials, what does Jesus do? He prepares a meal. This is Jesus' way of saying, our relationship may have been fractured, but I'm offering you a way back. Today, we're gonna to be participating in an event that's been observed by believers all around the world ever since the day Jesus instituted it more than 2,000 years ago. In many ways, this meal sends the same message as the meal covenant. No matter who you are or what you've done, you're invited to this table because Christ shed blood and broken body are the way back. This is a reconciliation meal. Now, if you were to attend this service in all the various churches of our community, you'd probably be surprised at the variety of beliefs and practices associated with it. At some of these services, they would use a single loaf of bread and a single cup. At others like ours, small pieces of bread and individual cups. At some churches, the people might come forward to an altar where they would receive the bread and the cup from a pastor or a priest, or they might have it brought to them in their seats. At other services, the priest alone would drink from the chalice or from the cup, and the people would only receive a white wafer. You would also find this service called by many different names. Some believers from a Greek tradition refer to it as a mystery. Other Christians with a Latin background call it a mass. You might also hear it referred to as a sacrament, which is a Latin word that means pledge of allegiance. Congregations influenced by the Protestant Reformation usually call this service the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table. Some refer to it as the Eucharist, which is the Greek word that means thanksgiving. And others refer to it as communion from the Greek word koinonia, which means fellowship or communion of the saints. Some Christians attach an almost magical significance to the Lord's table. There are even those who believe that in partaking of this meal, they're literally receiving Christ's body and his blood, and that guarantees their salvation. So in that faith tradition, the Lord's Supper is absolutely essential. 
On the other hand, there are those who ascribe almost no significance to communion. They go to the opposite extreme and make the Lord's Supper less than what it is. To those believers, communion is not nearly as meaningful as it should be. Now, from the Bible, what we understand is the Lord's Supper is not a magical rite, and neither is it merely a nice ceremony filled with nostalgic memories. Instead, this is a meal that can bring us into the presence of God, can help us deal with our brokenness, can restore fellowship with God and one another, and bring honor to Jesus Christ. I love the way John Calvin described what happens in communion. He said it simply, his life, that is Jesus' life, passes over into ours. So communion is meant to be a special touch from God. It's more than just a reminder. It's a place where we meet with God himself. Something else to keep in mind. The Lord's Supper is not a private contemplative act. Listen to this. Because there is one loaf, our manyness becomes oneness. Christ doesn't become fragmented in us. Rather, we become unified in him. We don't reduce Christ to what we are. He raises us to what he is. When Paul tells us about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians, all the pronouns he uses, you, yourselves, them, they're plural. In other words, the Lord's Supper is a family meal, a meal that's meant to be shared. In fact, too much church history, in too much church history, the supper has been treated as a private and individual act. Even if members partake of it as a part of a large congregation, all people are seen as individually and privately participating. But that principle doesn't square with how the Lord's Supper is presented to us in Scripture at all. This desire to eat and drink together is a universal human characteristic. In fact, even the words company and companion come from the same Latin root that means those who share bread. Partaking of food and drink seems to be a universal way of marking significant experiences like birthdays, anniversaries, weddings, funerals, and business deals are all marked by eating together. So it shouldn't surprise any of us that God has provided for us a holy meal, a meal to celebrate with others God's most magnificent gift. But let me also say, the Lord's Supper is a way of practicing our faith. It isn't the way. It's a part, it's a piece of the whole. An important part for sure, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper during Passover, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the details. But it's interesting that there's no record of the institution of communion in the Gospel of John. The only reference is about an evening meal that they shared. In addition, there's just four verses in the entirety of Mark's Gospel describing the Lord's Supper. There's four verses in Matthew's Gospel and only four verses in Luke. That's it. Most of the letters of the New Testament, except the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, have no reference to the Lord's Supper at all. Romans, which is a full treatment of the gospel, in its 16 chapters has no mention of the Lord's Supper. The book of Acts is full of preaching, evangelism, and baptism of new converts, with only a few references to communion after the early chapters. Matthew, Mark, and John give us no instruction to keep on observing it. It's really only in 1 Corinthians and Luke that Jesus tells us to do this in remembrance of him. And it's only 1 Corinthians that says, whenever you do it. So I'm not questioning, Jesus did want his people to adopt this practice of communion. I'm not questioning that at all. But some people teach that the Lord's Supper is central to everything we do. And all I'm saying is you'd be hard pressed to make that case based on how communion is presented in the word of God. Churches that make the Lord's Supper central often elevate communion above preaching. Even their church architecture demonstrates this. The pulpit is placed off to the side of the church. The table the Lord, for the Lord's Supper is front and center in the building. But if you read the gospel and you read the book of Acts, there's greater emphasis on the preaching of Jesus and the apostles. When you read the letters to the youngest churches, which is pretty much the rest of the New Testament, you find that almost none of them contain any reference to the Lord's Supper. That's why it's difficult to make what is secondary central. Now, of all people, you would expect John, the man who rested his head on Jesus and was seated at his right side at the banquet to give the most detail about the Last Supper. But here's all that John had to say about the meal that night. The evening meal was in progress. That's it. Instead of the Lord's Supper, John's emphasis is on the actual teaching that took place in the upper room, not the sacrament, not the Eucharist, not the institution of the Lord's Supper. So communion is important, but it's not all important. It's a great way to express our faith, 
but it's not the only way. It's awesome when we can enjoy it in the context of a weekend worship service, but it's not absolutely essential to every worship service. The New Testament simply doesn't treat it that way. And the New Testament never prescribes a frequency. It simply says, whenever you do it. So when you consider the fact that communion itself grew out of the Passover feast, which was a family meal, the ideal place to do communion is among your friends and family. In part, this is what I really like to empower you all to do. Though we're going to participate in communion together today, this is not something that's pastor-centered. It's Jesus-centered. I'd love to see you doing this periodically at home with your family or in your small groups as often as you would like to do it. I can tell you this, that even though I've been a Christian for nearly 50 years now, I've participated in communion far more frequently in my small group that I've been a part of for 30 years than I've ever done in the larger church family. Now, we're going to have some communion kits and instructions for people who are at our uh, live worship services on Sunday morning, but you can just be a part, you, if you're a part of our online community, what we're going to do is we're going to hand out these instructions that we're handing out in the, in the live service, and we're going to put them online so you can do communion at home. We will always do it periodically as a church family, but for those of you who crave more frequency, I want to set you free to do this on your own and in a context more like the original Passover meal, just like Jesus' example, which is a meal he shared with his friends. There's something else of great importance to notice about the institution of the Lord's Supper, and that's what my next point is all about. And that is before the ink was dry on the covenant, betrayal. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but at practically every juncture in human history, whenever God entered into a covenant with his people, he almost immediately after that covenant was ratified, there was a betrayal of that covenant on the part of the people of God. In other words, before the ink was even dry on the promises of God, we turn around and betray him. For example, God made a promise to Noah to never again destroy the world with a flood. And how does Noah repay him? By getting blind, stinking drunk. God made a covenant with Abraham to bless him, make of him a great people, give them a land of their own. And then at the first sign of difficulty, Abraham deserts the land and lies about his wife, Sarah. When God made a covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai, having already delivered them from slavery in Egypt, before Moses could return from the top of the mountain, Israel was cavorting like pagans around a golden idol. When David was promised that there would always be one of his descendants on the throne in God's kingdom, he repaid God by committing adultery and murdering the woman's husband. The Gospel of Mark points out this same covenant betrayal scenario by using something that's called chiastic structure or the sandwich technique. Now, I've shown you this in many books of the Bible. It's a very distinctive Jewish way of writing. As Westerners, when we write a story, we tend to build toward a main point, which typically lies at the end of the story. Jewish people didn't write like that. Instead, they would often sandwich their main point, not at the end, but at the center of a story. So in Mark's account of the first Lord's Supper, it's sandwiched between two accounts of betrayal by his innermost circle of friends. So before the supper, he predicts Judas' betrayal. Immediately after, he talks about Peter's betrayal. So when you read it, it goes from betrayal to Lord's Supper back to betrayal. That's what you call chiastic structure or the sandwich technique. Mark's point is that even though God is making this new covenant with his people, it's still marked by infidelity on our part. Every time God does something special for us, we answer it with unfaithfulness. So why does Mark emphasize that the very first communion happened in the midst of betrayal? Because God is reminding us that we're not in a relationship with him because we deserve it. In the first communion, the one that's our pattern, the one we're to look back on as our example for all time, on that night, communion was attended by a traitor and a bunch of cowards, men who would either turn Jesus in for the money or would run from him to save their own skin. The first communion, what many consider the holiest and purest moment in the life of the church, began and ended with betrayal. Friends, hear me saying this. Communion is for the undeserving. And let me tell you why this is so important. There's a, uh, there's a verse in the book of Corinthians that's been abused and perverted to mean something that it does not. It's this verse. Who, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. 
Now, this verse, misinterpreted by preachers, has kept more people away from the communion table than anything else I know. People have been taught that this verse means you have to be worthy of communion, that there shouldn't be the slightest hint of sin in your life or else you better abstain. But friends, this verse is not about your personal worthiness at all. I mean, think about it. If that's the standard, then none of the disciples should have been included in the very first communion. No, what this verse is talking about is the manner in which we partake of it. In particular, in Corinth, they were mistreating the poor during the Lord's Supper when the rich were overindulged and the poor were given scraps. I have an entire chapter in my book about the patron-client relationship in Corinth and how they were mistreating the poor. I'm not going to unfold all that or unpack all that right now, but you can read that on your own later. But hear me saying this. At Jesus' feast, no one gets in because they're worthy. No one has the right to turn others away because this is Christ's meal. And as host, he sets the rules. And he made clear in the very first one, the undeserving ones are the ones it's intended for. I love what was written by a Catholic sister, Nancy Mayer. She said, I don't partake because I'm a good Catholic, holy and pious and sleek. I partake because I'm a bad Catholic, riddled by doubt and anxiety and anger, fading from se severe hyperglycemia of the soul. It's because I take this aspect of the very first communion seriously. One of my favorite invitations to this meal is this simple paragraph. I want to read it to you. Come to this service, not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify, not that you're righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you're strong, but because you're weak. Not because you have any claim on heaven's rewards, but because in your frailty and sin, you stand in constant need of heaven's mercy. That's Jesus' invitation to you. So I want to, you to all join me and be a part of communion today, not because you're worthy, not because you have your life together, not because you're sinless and spotless in your heart, but because you need what Jesus has to offer. You need his grace. You need more of his presence. You need his covering for your sins. God invited the unfaithful of heart, the ones who betray to a place of love and acceptance where I'm loved just as I am. This has always been the cry of the human family. God, will you take us back? We know we've messed up. We know that even after we've been following him for years, we're still capable of doing things that cause us humiliation and shame. God's answer to the human family is a meal where he says, come as you are, gather around my table, be reconciled to me. This meal is what heals ruptured relationships. So let's talk about how communion is to be observed. First, it's not a passive cerebral event, but an active participation. You know, for most 21st century believers, we've lost the significance of these words. Do this in remembrance of me. We hear remember and we think, well, I'm supposed to mentally recall the facts of the crucifixion. So communion becomes a head trip, a passive and largely cerebral event, something that takes place only in my mind. When we reduce communion to that, we run the risk of what's talked about in 1 Corinthians 11. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. In other words, it becomes too familiar. We do it by rote. It becomes mechanical and therefore unmeaningful. To the first Christians, the act of remembrance was more than just recalling something. It was active participation. It meant to experience the event in a new way through ritual repetition. So communion is not primarily a time for thinking about the historical ministry of Jesus. It's a time to connect and commune with Christ. And when we do it that way, communion becomes a fresh touch from God. It's all about Jesus entering my present reality, our broken hearts, our grief, our pain, our happiness, our plans. Really, wherever you happen to be in this present moment, you're inviting Jesus to come join you there. I receive Christ in the bread and the cup. It's my invitation to enter my present moment and be for me what I need in this moment. Something else, we're not attending a funeral. It's a victory supper. You know, too often our thinking is out of balance when it comes to communion. We get stuck in the mentality of perpetual Good Friday. For many, communion has become a funeral for poor Jesus rather than the celebration it actually is. I mean, think about this. The origin of the Lord's Supper has its roots in the Jewish Passover celebration. 
Jesus took the elements of that Passover meal and redefined them. This is how Passover is described in the Old Testament. This is the day you're invite you're to commemorate for generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Now, if you walk out of slavery after 400 years, like the Jewish people did, your father was a slave and his father was a slave. And so was your great grandfather and your great, great grandfather. As far back as you can remember, you've been slaves. Then God gives you a meal to commemorate the event that finally set you free. You can mark it down. That meal is going to be a celebration. The Passover is a celebration of the emancipation of the Jewish people from slavery. So let me ask you, what should a meal look like, like communion, that celebrates the greatest freedom ever brought to humankind? Should it be a funeral or a celebration? Communion is meant to restore our perspective on life, to remind us that God has already dealt with the worst that this life has to offer, and he's been victorious. It's to remind us that there's nothing in your life so great that God is not greater. And then finally, we also send our roots deeper into Christ. Jesus said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Notice what Jesus said. In doing this, we remain in Christ and Christ remains in us. You might recognize the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a brilliant young pastor, a seminary teacher who opposed Adolf Hitler's policies in the 1930s. So on April 5th, 1943, the Germans arrested Bonhoeffer and put him in prison. Two years later, the Nazis executed him, hanging him on the gallows just before the Allies swept in to liberate Germany. About 10 weeks after his arrest, Bonhoeffer ended, uh, ended a letter to his parents with these simple words. It is Monday, and I was just sitting down to a dinner of turnips and potatoes when a parcel you sent arrived. Such things give me greater joy than I can say. Although I'm utterly convinced that nothing can break the bonds between us, I seem to need some outward token or sign to reassure me. I suppose it's rather like the felt need in our religion for the sacraments. Do you get what he's saying? Bonhoeffer is saying that even though he knew his mom and dad loved him, he needed to be periodically reminded of their love in tangible ways. His packages from home were that reminder, tangible expressions of his parents' love for him. And then Bonhoeffer drew this parallel between the Lord's Supper and his parents' gift. The Lord's Supper is like a package from home. It's a tangible expression of God's love for us, a physical, touchable reality that God has not forgotten us, that he is with us, that he loves us. So communion is about connection, to experience Christ afresh. What do you need for Jesus to do for you today? Where are you struggling? What are you afraid of? Where are you feeling all alone? As you partake in communion, I want you to visualize Jesus confronting your fear and hear him speaking words of hope. If you're feeling lonely right now, visualize Jesus walking into that empty place and joining you there. Based on what Jesus said and did in the New Testament, what does Jesus say to you right now? Whatever you're facing or feeling, see Jesus entering into that experience alongside you because this is what happens in communion. We become one with him. He becomes one with us. So now that you understand what this meal is all about and why we do it and what it represents and who is invited and what God does for us, let's pray together and then we'll participate in communion together. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for this moment in time that we have, for all you're doing and all you are capable of doing and all you will continue to do in our lives. Right now, Lord, as we approach this time of participating in communion together, be for us our daily food. Hear this as our invitation, God, to come and join us where we are, meeting us with what we need, whatever that might be. This is a time, Lord, we not only want to reflect on what you accomplished through the cross, but more importantly, we want to connect. We want to commune. We want to be in union with you. And so, Lord, in this moment, I pray, God, that you will join us in this holy place. In your name I pray, amen. So this is Jesus' instruction to us. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks, and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, take and eat, this is my body, the bread of life, the body of Christ given for you.
Thank you, Lord. Now listen to this. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. The cup of salvation, the blood of Jesus Christ. I love what Jesus said in that verse. He said that he wouldn't drink of this cup again until we all are reconstituted as a family of God on the other side of eternity. And there in the new kingdom, he would join us in celebrating this meal together. So communion is a look to the past, a reminder of Christ's sacrifice. A communion is a look to this present moment, that Jesus is joining me in this present moment through these simple elements. But it's also a look to the future. It's anticipation that one day in the new kingdom, we'll all be together with Jesus. And we're going to celebrate this meal on the other side. And that's going to be a glorious day. Would you pray with me? Father, you are so good. What a day and a moment this is. Thank you, God, that you are our daily nourishment. You are our bread. You are our cup. You respond to our invitation to you to come and join us in our present reality. And God, it doesn't matter how wonderful or messy that reality is. You do what you promise to do. You become one with us. I thank you, God, for that wonderful promise. I pray, God, for anybody listening to me right now who's feeling really, really alone, that God, in this holy moment, in this sacred moment, this invitation that we've offered to you by consuming the bread that represents your body and the cup that represents your blood, that God, this invitation that has gone out to you, that you would join them in that lonely place, that you would love them in that, that you would speak your words of hope and comfort. God, for those who are just in such a wonderful place today, so many things are going right in their life, so many things are going well, help them to realize, God, that you join them in those moments too that you celebrate alongside your people, that, God, you are happy to join us no matter where we find ourselves to be. And that's the beauty of the gospel. And I thank you, Lord, that I don't have to have it all right or have it all together to join you in this sacred meal, but that, God, you welcome me as I am, knowing that this meal represents a reconciliation moment between us and you. Thank you for loving me in my waywardness. Thank you, God, for loving me when I've gone astray. Thank you, God, that you have been so committed to this plan that from the inception, from Adam and Eve and the slaughter of the animal to cover their sins, to the people of God and the lamb that was sacrificed to cover the sins for a family and a nation, to ultimately Jesus Christ, who would be the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb, who for once and all would take away the sins of the world. God, I thank you that that's my promise and my reality, that I join with the family of God that's being constituted now on this side of the cross. I thank you, God, for my brothers and sisters who have that assurance today that they know that they're a part of your family family, that you belong to them and they belong to you. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. God bless you. I hope it's a great week.